Hello again to everyone. Um, I'm so glad you um, uh, enjoyed the first session from the remarks that have come up. And now we're moving into our second session, our panel event. Um, I would like to introduce our speakers. You saw their photos just now. We've got an, an international set with us today. And um, I'm going to ask the panelists some questions and we're going to, um, uh, they're going to answer in reverse alphabetical order, but I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. How's that? Just to confuse everybody. So first of all, a warm welcome to John, John Deming, who's our professor here of computer science. He's also the director of uh, the Knowledge Media Institute, and he's president of STI International a semantics focused networking organization. John is always pushing the boundaries uh, with technology, but also with learning, how it can impinge on learning, and is very well known and um, leads multi-million uh, pound <laughs> projects. And we've also got, now we'll move in alphabetical order to Alison, Professor Alison Littlejohn. Alison is the director of the U U uh, University College London Knowledge Lab. This is a cutting edge centre looking at the future of education with technology. She's a learning scientist specialising in professional and digital learning. And she's too started her career as a scientist like myself. And um, welcome. Professor Mpini. Maker from South Africa, and Mpini is the Commonwealth of Learning has the Commonwealth of Learning Chair in Open Educational Practice Resources at the University of South Africa. That's UNISA, and she's a National Research uh, Foundation rated prof research professor in Open Distance and e-learning. Welcome, Mpini. We're looking forward to what you're going to tell us today. And finally, but not least, we've got Professor Albert Sangra Mora from uh, the Open University of Catalonia. He has, has a distinguished chair, UNESCO chair in education and technology for social change at the University of Catalonia. And has since 2016 is a director of the industrial doctorates program at the Government of Catalonia. So welcome everyone. So we're going to Thank start you. with Albert and we're going to start with our first question and take about five minutes as we go around the table. So first of all, you know, what was one of the major challenges of this online pivot and what did you learn from addressing those challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Denise. First of all, thank you for inviting me to share uh, this session with these distinguished colleagues and, and, and however, friends too, that uh, I, I, I can enjoy this, this period of time with all of you. So, uh, well, going to, the, to your question, I would like to start with some words from a Uruguayan poet, Mario Benedetti, who said, when we thought we had all the answers, suddenly all the questions were changed. And I think this is the mm -hmm. feeling most of us uh, had when uh, facing the situation uh, in March 2020. This was the real situation. A lot of things that we uh, considered that were the right ways to do things were completely changed and we need to start doing things in a different way as if we were starting to learn to walk. So uh, considering this, I think that the change is huge in general. So it's difficult to say how, what is the major challenge, of course. But in this particular approach, I have to say that, as you probably all of you know, I'm coming from an open university that is a, a fully online since our inception. So, in fact, for us, there were not uh, 
very relevant changes at my institution because everything was done in the same way we used to do it other than adapting let's say a kind of saying softening some procedures uh, to the learner issues for instance uh, some lack of a good connection some family problems especially in some latin american countries where we have some of our students so we tried to adapt this situation to the to the needs of these students in order to make more flexible even all the procedures we have in our institution. But I have to say that probably because we didn't experience with face-to-face -face teaching, it means that probably we were uh, better um, prepared or more ready to face this situation, even if none of us liked this situation at all. The second thing is that uh, Due to this situation, we were asked to provide some support to other institutions. And I think that this was the most uh, important challenge we had, uh, at least personally. And uh, I, I, I will uh, divide this institution in two big blocks. One is uh, support to schools. Uh, they asked for this support because they got absolutely confused. You know. It had never happened before. To move online was something simply impossible in a school setting. So this is not an alternative for anyone, but uh, in, in, suddenly in a moment, they should move to do everything online. And then most of the teachers and institutions ask institutions or universities as, as like us in order to help them to manage how they can uh, do things in that way, how they can adapt to this new situation, what they can learn from the experience of other institutions that uh, work in that way for since a long time. And the third element or the second block of that is that we have collaborated in and lead several university initiatives uh, with other universities. We try to support them by elaborating resources and supporting the the change and the transformation that some of these institutions should have. <laughs> to do that, we develop a webinar series in order to uh, support the different elements of change. Let's say design, assessment, um, activities, uh, uh, mm, sorry, uh, dynamis dynamization, uh, interaction, uh, feedback, and so on. And secondly, uh, and lightly, we also publish a book summarizing all these tips and ideas in order to help all people to move to this situation. And this this book was was provided free of charge, uh, easily accessible uh, online, in order to make able to everyone to take advantage of this book. Uh, it will be published also in English because we publish it in Spanish because most of our needs were coming from Latin American countries, but we are going to publish the book also in English next uh, July or maybe um, 1st of September. So the second question about what uh, did we learn or what did I learn? I, I tried to summarize very briefly some of the learning uh, from this situation. First is COVID-19 has been a historical emergency, both health and educational. And that is very important to take into consideration because it didn't happen never before. So, so it's important to say that we were in a situation that that all the institutions, educational institutions were closed. And this was the first time we lived that in our lives. Second, lockdowns don't let the students to attend to educational institutions. So this is also very important because we can say that maybe, um, uh, OK, we don't like online and so on, but if the digital group uh, in reality has been the only escape valuable because no online education meant no education at all at that particular moment. So this was something that has been learned by a lot of people in that sense. And uh, we also learned that we could not plan the reaction 
to the situation, but we know that it could be improved. And this is something that has to be assumed as a learning from this process. We, we, we can improve our reaction to this situation. And probably we can do, the, do it uh, from a, another learnings we had. First, the digital divide is still a great barrier. We, we did know that, but now we, we probably we have suffered even more. That teachers' digital competencies is far away from the expected or desired. That not all that glitters is gold. And I think it's important to, to, to highlight this, that remote teaching is not quality online education. And a lot of people have understood that this is true. And finally, that hybridization of learning is already there. And probably we need to think on new hybrid models in order to develop the real potential of technology without um, avoiding face-to-face -face, uh, education, especially at the school level, of course. But we need to integrate technology in a different way as we did until now. I think that in order to be short, these are the most important reflections I can share with you at this moment. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to move and ask Alison to give us her views. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And can I just say what a pleasure it is to be with friends and colleagues at the Open University and uh, and to share the day with you today and, and to learn. I've learned so much already about some of the insights that you've had. Um, I think that the questions that Denise is asking are, are very important. And, uh, you know, going back to Albert's statement at the very beginning, uh, when we started finding the answers, the questions changed. I actually think that when we started finding the answers, some of the questions that should have been asked could not be ignored. And that's going to be the theme of what I say over the next um, few minutes. At uh, University College London in, in March, when we had the, the closure of campus, we decided to investigate how academics and professional staff were experiencing this rapid transfer to working from home and moving to online teaching and research. We recognised that this was one of the biggest moments that higher education had ever experienced in, in its many hundred years history. And in particular, we were interested in finding out were any specific groups disadvantaged by working from home and could universities reduce these, stop ignoring and try to reduce these inequalities. So uh, so in March, what we did was we, we launched a survey which was based on some work by some of my colleagues, Leslie Gurley and Martin Oliver, who you may know. They had a methodology where we asked people to upload photos of their experience, um, and something that would depict how they felt about the experience of working online, uh, teaching online, researching remotely and working from home, and then to write some narratives around this. And, uh, you know, many people uploaded pictures of, of where they worked. So we could see that people, some were in, in very nice offices or had um, repurposed a shed outside. But a lot of people also were working in very cramped conditions. And we had photos of people who were in shared accommodation, had a very small room, not much bigger than their bed. And they were actually working literally from their bed and teaching from there. And that was um, quite distressing for some people. We also had uh, a, a number of images which depict how women in particular felt about being pulled between their work and also the, the caring at home. Um, but also uh, many women were taking on more responsibility for supporting students. And um, we were very interested in the idea of a pedagogy of care in online learning, building on uh, work by Noddings from the early 90s, uh, where the idea is that relationships with students need to be built on trust, respect and reciprocity. And uh, how were teachers engrossed in their students in these new uh, new environments? Now, 
UCL, like many campus universities, tended to move from uh, on-site, on-campus teaching to um, to lecturing online and tutorials online, particularly people who didn't have a lot of experience of online teaching. Um, And so we recognised that we perhaps weren't implementing the best online learning or or the principles or learning design um, in in the best possible way. But, you know, colleagues had literally a weekend to, to transfer to online. And we were interested in the caring aspects of pedagogy and how that was enacted. And there, so there are four key learnings that um, that I'd like to share with you. The first is that we found that teachers really need to interact with students and that caring for students involves understanding their needs rather than assuming what their, those needs are. And that requires teachers to be disposed to students and and to make themselves available. And that could be very difficult for a lot of um, the academics in the lockdown conditions. And and as I said earlier, we found that it was women who were tending to make themselves available. The second thing is the emotions associated with these interactions is not normally acknowledged in our everyday work. So that's something that we need to think about. Teaching involves the management of a teacher's emotions uh, and the emotions of the students. And it's, uh, it's something that we really need to highlight and perhaps reward much more. The third thing is there's a personal cost to the idea of a teacher replicating caring pedagogy online. So we, we know that on campus it's relatively easy for for a teacher to understand how the student feels and and to to respond to that but we found that our academics some of them felt responsible they felt guilty for not being there and and also because they didn't have the experience of using technologies to really understand how students were feeling that was difficult for them the final point is um, these emotional dimensions are exaggerated when you make yourself disposable to students. And uh, we found that it it was quite difficult for academics, uh, especially when some of the students were not switching on their cameras and so on. So so what have we done to try to address them? Well, we're trying to recognise more this pedagogy of care and the demands that there are. We're also looking at some of the structural inequalities and we want to try and really recognise these and reduce them. Uh, One of the ways that we're doing this is is to try to develop much better informed policy in terms of HR and also the support for teaching for students. So uh, UCL has significantly changed policy going forward, but obviously what we need to do over time is is to test these policies and particularly when we return to campus and when the teaching uh, changes again and perhaps becomes more blended. So I'd be interested to hear what colleagues think about some of these points I've raised. Thank you, Alison. And now let's move to Mpini. Could you uh, help us now, Ampini, with the discussion, moving it forward? Thank you very much, Denise, uh, for the opportunity to come and present um, at this seminar. And I I listened attentively to what was uh, presented earlier and very, very interesting presentations. Well done to the researchers. Um, I'm going to be speaking about what we found ourselves in, almost all of us. Um, and and as the, we were faced with lengthier, lengthier short shutdowns, and I think for some of us when it started, we thought that we'll be back to normal in two months or something like that. And then things kept on going on and on, and we realized that we need to do something. And governments and everybody want, wanted to start with us moving into an online space. And then we had to respond to this need very urgently. 
whether we were ready or not. And this was happening across lecturers. We at UNISA, it's a, it's a distance, it's an ODL institution, but we have not been doing a lot of online. There are courses that are 100% online, but many of the courses are not online. And, and uh, when we are faced with situation like this, in countries of limited resources, we found that there are a lot more challenges of issues of connectivity, of the ICT infrastructure in general, the devices that people have, the accessibility of those things were just not there. And then secondly, when teachers have to teach and they are used to teaching in a specific space, then you are expecting them to teach in a different environment at a high speed, I, may, I might add, they need some element of pedagogy. How do I teach in an online space? And what we found during that time, especially with teachers who are already in the field, not necessarily our students, is that they took um, their classroom literally taking their classroom into an online space where a teacher would stand there in front of a student or, or a group of students who are, who are distributed all over the place and teach them the way they would teach them in an online environment. And for a young 15-year-old or 12-year-old, it was a grueling um, exercise. It was not easy for them. It was not also easy for the teachers, but they had to do it because it's, that's the only way that we can, we, we could have done that. So as we were looking at that, and this was uh, towards the end of April, we were looking at that, we decided that we should try and do something. And this is, I'm going to report mainly on the community engaged project that we do. Once we, our students get out of the system, we forget that they have gone out and they can be able to, 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 to perform wherever they are. So the, the challenge here was how do I recruit these teachers who are already in the field to come in and, and just be assisted. And this was really a stopgap thing. So what we did, was to, to use our networks and, and um, invite teachers to those who are already in the field. And at that time, they were, all of them were on lockdown. So they attended this, this course. So what I did was to come up with two open education resources, one from the OERU on digital literacies for online learning, and the other one was from OU take your teaching online. And I thought that once I give them these resources, they will be able to navigate their way through it. And little did I know that I'm going to get so many response based on this, that there's this free course that will assist you to work on in an online space. And, and when people came through, then we had to think on our feet, organically changing things. As we, as, as we moved along. We realized that we're getting far more than the numbers that we anticipated. With the first email, we, we got a response of 190 teachers who, who were interested in, 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 in doing this. And I thought there wouldn't even be more than 50. So I thought, well, I can handle it. Then I had to recruit other people to come and assist me in, 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 in this regard. But as we, we were starting, the numbers started to grow. And we had to come up with other dif dif different ways of doing things. And I realized that although people have technologies that we think they do have, they don't know how to use them for teaching and learning, for teaching in particular. And, and trying to teach them in an environment that they are unfamiliar with, it's even much more difficult. So we introduced a white WhatsApp groups. So we decided to form, to, to take them back to the WhatsApp groups. And in these groups, it was a group of small, it was small groups. And we divided people uh, as, uh, people or students uh, seven to, into seven to eight persons because when they are smaller groups, then they're able to talk amongst themselves. So WhatsApp groups had two functions. One was a peer support, was meant to support um, because we already have content uh, through uh, OER to support them on how to navigate they are, they, they navigate the digital space and understanding how the digital space work. So what, what they did is that their, their peers 
their friends were assisting them during that. We don't learn the same way. Some learn better or faster than others. So those that have learned faster, like in a group, you'll find one person who has learned faster. They were able to go back and say, if you click this, this is what happens. If you click this, this is what happens. So people begin to, began to to understand that progress. And part of it, again, was to strengthen the network because we were afraid that we we're going to lose them if there's no uh, glue that keeps them together. So the peers um, strengthened that network. And, and unfortunately, because we're doing this in such a hurry, we didn't really look at the how, how, how we, we saw it working and we left it at that and that let, let it continue the way it continued. And by that time, we already had about 300 um, teachers who have signed, signed up for the course. So then, then we realized again that probably they don't know how to start. Then we had an orientation program, and this was an would be an online workshop where we orientate them to the material. We orientate them to how they need to navigate the space and all those things. And 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 I think what was critical was the digital skills that. People, it was very, very difficult for people to get their way around the digital space. And like all of us, you know, when you press one button and it's not functioning, you just um, give up. So that's why the peers came in to support each other, to, to support them in an environment that they were familiar with. And then I had a group of six colleagues and we called us a laborers of love because this was not attached to the institution. This was something that we, that we did just to assist teachers. And, and all they did regularly was to send a question and just to, to make sure that students engage and, and also check out the, the progress that the students were making and, and also gauge the learning by, by posing questions on regular basis so that the students can see that there's a teacher even in those groups. So the, the, the groups would be managed by a, a, a teacher, maybe a group of six people, will, of, of, of six, six groups will be managed by one um, e-tutor. We, we called each other e-tutors. Will be managed by one e-tutor. So the e-tutor's role was not to look at things as individuals, looking at students' work as individuals, but looking at students' work in terms of groups and then send it back to groups to, 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 so that groups can be able to assist each other. So we learned, um, I think maybe just um, what, what we learned during this responsive stage is that really is what Albert was talking about, that, you know, we were just doing things organically. That's, num that, that's the first thing. We did things organically. We did things that we are not aware that have not been tested, no plans, no nothing. We just went on with it as, as it's going around. We, we recognized the need and we identified the need. We identified people that will be able to, that we will be able to assist. And this because it was community-based and community-driven project. It also assisted us that sometimes as we are doing things, we forget that there they are skills that needs to be to be um to be re renewed. And, and this is also against policies and practices that we are familiar with. As, as teachers in the field. So, so and the familiarity again, when people are in so much unfamiliarity tests, it's always important to take them back to the familiar space. And the familiar space for us was to use WhatsApp in order for them to teach them in the, uh, to do what they can do. So I will leave it at that. And um, I think I've gone through my five minutes, but um, thank you very much. Thank you, MP. So, last but not least, we're going to ask John to come in, and uh, over to you, John. 
Thank you, Denise. Um, so I'm not sure if I want to speak, but just sit here and applaud my previous speakers. So so thanks a lot for that. Um, I, I take a slightly different view from them because uh, so I lead a depart a, a unit with 80 people and we don't do any teaching, but carry out research into new technology, which the OU can use to teach its um, many students. So I, I really liked Albert's quote at the beginning of um, all the questions suddenly changing and and that I might even describe my job so so my job is to ask questions of the OU and say by the way did you think of this did you think of that um, th the pandemic is obviously objectively a very bad thing um, but from my um, professional point of view I, I see it as a as a lens that the pandemic has exposed structural weaknesses in society at large um, in, in many areas, in, um, for example, in race, uh, um, um, in uh, disadvantaged, um, in a, uh, inequality in jobs, etc. In the education sphere, what I see is exposing um, issues that have been around for decades in that education has always been a laggard with respect to technology. Um, there's a mismatch between the affordances that technology provide and have provided for a long time, what society needs and what employers need and what education provides. And <laughs> this this very big jump to online just exposed on them. And as M. Pini was saying, uh, what a, a lot happened at the beginning is, is, is what I see in the early days of film, where instead of making films, they put a camera in front of a play and that's not putting a camera in front of a play is not the same as making a film uh, um, um, today. Um, and I can think of examples, so for examples, why do we test students, especially in STEM, by making them write with a pencil on a piece of paper without the internet? And what's, how's that related to their future careers? Uh, I, I struggle to understand that sometimes. So um, online teaching, as the OU is known for um, uh, the whole existence, 51 years, is really can be split into two parts, the generation of high quality content and teaching delivery. At the beginning of the lockdown in, in March 2020, I focused on content generation. I saw other universities uh, struggling how to produce high quality content because we know at the OU, this is a time intensive, costly business. We spend tens of millions of pounds, many tens of millions of pounds every year in, in generating content. And, and I thought with a team, um, wouldn't it be great if there was a, an online library of high quality educational materials for educators, where educators could go to and, and then pull the elements from. So I started, um, um, we invested some um, uh, um, OU funds in, in producing a proof of concept for this. And um, we also had funding from UFI to look at this from a, a further education point of view. This is plus 16 education. And then from January, we've been um, collaborating with JISC. So, so the question for us was, how can we support people in further education and in university education in having a, having a nice library? And we built some proof of concepts and we went out and talked to um, 150 people. We also ran an event with 100 people in, in December. So, um, uh, so if I talk about the, the issues and barriers, I think pretty much all of these have been said before. And, and it's funny how the, somehow when you look at this, they're obvious, but um, um, they're not taken up. There's a lack of digital expertise. There's a lack of online pedagogical expertise, uh, generally both with the practitioners who are the educators, this is not everyone, but in general, and also leaders. So there's an issue that you may have individual educators that say, this is a great thing, I want to do it. If they, But if they don't have support of leadership, then that's an issue. And then vice versa, the leadership may think it's a good idea, but they need the expertise in, in um, the education of the workforce. Uh, there's also a lack of capacity. We talked to lots and lots of educators. And the first thing they said to us was, I have no time. I have no time to make materials, um, uh, even if they, they wanted to. The other thing we had from um, FE educators was people don't want to just find materials. They want to adapt them. They need to adapt them to the local context, which is mostly driven from the assessment. So, so what assessment and what curriculum are they targeting? 
and, and how can they adapt for this? And then also, as others have said, there's a lack of infrastructure um, uh, um, around these. On, on the positive side, um, there's enormous appetite from the community. So at the event that we ran, we had, I think, 4.4 or 4.5 out of five in terms of is isn't would a, a national aggregator of educational resources be a good thing um, the other thing that we found um, which was a bit interesting so even though we're talking about a national resource which is online regionality is important so in, in a couple of ways um, some of the learning contexts at least in the uk are regional so for example in the midlands um, in england people like to teach engineering um, because there's a large automobile industry there. And we saw these aspects of the local employer context uh, um, influencing the, the online teaching context. Regionality was also important for trust. So if, if um, an educator is looking for online materials, um, they tend to trust recommendations that are not general, but from known colleagues or from the local area. So then we, we, we posited that what one needs is a federated, uh, um, a federation of regional aggregations of learning resources that, that would feed in together. Um, on the technical side, um, uh, I won't say so much about this, but, but really um, in terms of the things that we built, and, and some of these are uh, online, if you go to vocteach.ac.uk, um, um, it, it's really one needs an aggregator of content. So, th so the whole system needs to be easy because the educators need no time. So imagine something like um, Google, but it's a, it's a search engine which is specifically geared to learning. So you're not typing in keywords, you're, you're typing in learning outcomes, learning outcomes and skills and, and employment, and you're finding uh, materials. Educators may want to look for different types of materials. So I'm looking for an assessment, I'm looking for a quiz, I'm looking for a, uh, um, for a video. Um, I, in my lab, we have an aggregator already. It's not for education, it's for research papers. So we, we, we run a national service in the UK called CORE, CORE AC UK, which is in the top 2000 websites on, on the world. Um, and it aggregates over 200 million research papers. So it scours the web, looks for open libraries of research papers, and then automatically integrates them. And, and we thought something like that with trusted sources of content, so you know, from the Open University and maybe from the BBC, would be useful. The, the other ingredients one needs is um, something to generate the metadata automatically so there's no human effort so saying that this is this piece of content i found is for this level it's suitable for this curriculum or this assessment um you need this reading age and and it has these types it has contains quizzes uh, and videos um, and then the last element in terms of usability is educators don't really want a search engine because if you search you can find lots of things that aren't useful, but really a recommendation engine. So more like Netflix. So if people have a their favorite uh, um, uh, online media uh, uh, company like Netflix or, or Amazon Prime, where um, as you log on, it knows about you. So it would know you're an educator, it knows you're teaching um, 17 year olds, um, you're teaching a craft course or an English course, you're teaching vocational skills. Um, and um, uh, it, 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 it knows about your context, so a heavy engineering context. It would know about your region. It will uh, make recommendations about your, um, your local education network. Um, there'd also be the ability that if I adapt things, I, take, I pull some things, I generate a new learning path on the things I found. Then a bit like Pinterest, if people know that, you can put a new pathway or a Spotify playlist. So I put my own playlist of re re learning resources so, uh, up in there. So we, we built, as I said, we built a couple of proof of concepts and we, um, we did preliminary tests with educators um, uh, and they, they um, seemed to think this was good. Um, at the end of April, we had a discussion with the Department of Education in England, and, and they're going through a discoverability phase, uh, um, which we will uh, learn through them. So I would say that the main lessons that uh, we learned is um, similar to before. There are various barriers, but, but there are also um, 
uh, uh, opportunities into what this tech could provide, especially as um, let's say this one of the silver linings in, in the pandemic is online learning has had a lot more awareness and visibility and, and far more people, including decision makers, begin to understand the possibilities for this. Thank you, John. We've so much to think about from what was presented and spoken about with great heart, I think. Everybody, you know, is so involved in this and wanting to improve everything for everyone all at the same time, um, which is quite a problem. So I've asked a very difficult question um, because, you know, we haven't got a crystal ball, but I'm asking you really to have a look inside your crystal ball and just give a few pointers to how you see things developing um, near future, longer term. So I'm going to ask Albert again to kick us off with that um, thought. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I also forgot to break my crystal ball, Denise. So, <laughs> And in addition, I know that the future is no longer as it was, so so it's more difficult even to to identify that. But anyway, I will try to share some thoughts from my from my humble perspective. The first thing is that I, I used to to think that even previously to the to the pandemic, there were, uh, from my perspective, four catalysts that were uh, helping to make a metamorphosis of learning. There were that these connecting networks that enable connected learning on one hand. The second one was the empowerment of learners. And here there are related the concepts of self-regulation and autonomy. The third was the overcoming of time and space barriers. And here it's linked also the concept of time management. And the fourth one is the acceptance of the existence of an unconscious, informal, invisible and silent learning. But the pandemic has, bring, uh, has brought us another one, another catalyst for that, that is that kind of discontinuity or inter intermittence generated by the situation of the COVID-19. So all these are making the uh, learning change. But my question at the end is, OK, it could change. And some of the questions, the, the, the words I have mentioned I think they will be very important, but as I will finish uh, my, my my short speech, I have some doubts if uh, at the end these things will make the learning really change. On one hand, I have a question for myself: that is, do universities have a wolf a wolf by the ears? Because uh, I'm not sure about they should have learned that they must begin to develop a kind of high quality student centered online programs as offered by institutions with experience in the field in order to be ready for other similar circumstances because they have they have had to learn that uh, probably the only screen driven um, face-to-face -face lectures were not the solution for uh, pivoting online. This is important. And most of the universities said, we did it. But they don't ask themselves what they did. That it's not exactly what they could do in another uh, environment. So on another hand, institutions that are not able to work differently will simply end up having to stop working. And this will be a, 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 a real disruption in, in this sense. In other words, also transformation of higher institution educations cannot be relegated to a mere change in management or in te or technocratic engineering that sometimes it seems to be. They should need to uh, rethink everything because this situation is provoking a rethought of the or rethink of the whole approach to education too. So uh, I, I think that one of the lines to follow is the move to hybrid models of education. And even if I, I'm not going to, to go further on that, 
uh, even if fully online will persist because of the students. Some people say the future will be only hybrid. I don't think so, because I think that there will be students that need that 100 percent flexibility in order to follow the learning they need. So probably they will keep some institutions being fully online, but most of the face to face ones will need to move to a hybrid models in order to provide the students uh, some of this flexibility that hey, ha they have experienced during this period of time. But they should be a good experience, not the bad experience that some of them have lived. So moving to these hybrid models of education will mean probably to take advantage of the distance or online look to design consistently uh, added value hybrid models quite different to those that are considered blended in which the look is from the face to face uh, vision and they add some online drops to die to, to, to that. This is not the, the good way in order to to build consistent uh, hybrid models. They should be more flexible regarding organization structure and time these models. So time management, as I said before, is very important. Not everything has to be or could be synchronous. Albert, so, uh, so yes, Albert, I'm, I'm my, finishing. Yeah, yeah, because my time management's not doing right, very Yes, well. so, so I will finish. Uh, the only thing that I would say is uh, that uh, I'm a bit skeptical because after the storm comes the calm and, and the kind of pendulum effect that can have, uh, I think that will make us to come back to try to do to consider the new normal as we did before. And this is quite dangerous. I have some other uh, thoughts, but it's OK. So sorry for 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 going uh, beyond the time. Thank you, Albert. Over to you, Alison. You're muted, Alison. Can you hear me now? We can. Good. Uh, difficulty unmuting, uh, but we had to. Uh, we had to say you're muted once in this meeting, at least. Uh, I, I was saying thanks for the question, Denise, uh, because predicting the future has just. We, we just seen it's much more difficult than than we can ever anticipate, and what seems unbelievable can become real. I think going forward um, and talking with our students, we know that they're very keen to go back to campus. Now, I'm talking from the perspective of someone who works on a, a campus university. They're very keen to get back because um, at UCL, the students like the experience of, of being in London, of meeting face to face with other students and, and so on. However, when they get back, we know that they'll expect things to be quite different. So it's a kind of subtle, let's go back to the way things were. Actually, things will never go back to the way that they were. And what we need to do is to learn yet again how to deal with the new normal situation, however it unfolds. And I think there, there are four key things that we need to think about. The first is, and related to what I said before, how we deal with um, the emotions that we have when we have the the online and how how we regulate those and enable them. So for our teachers, for example, it's really important that they develop the ability to understand how to properly interact and understand what students are experiencing and similarly that students are able to interact with their academics in in a, a far broader range of ways than we did before. The second is around data usage because we've seen that um, a lot of tech has become embedded in ways that it wasn't before and so that this is um, in some ways a good thing it allowed us to do things that we couldn't do before but also it has to be regulated and I think that governments have to get really serious about how they regulate the the use the measurement and analysis and use of data otherwise we'll end up with with a pandemic which is around the data 
Um, third is adaptability. We've seen a huge change and, and this adaptability is going to be an integral part of how we work. But we need to be able to learn about how to do that better. Otherwise, we can all end up with some kind of burnout. And finally, there are structural inequalities that have been highlighted during the pandemic. I, I mentioned particularly um, pedagogy of caring and how that particularly affects women. But we know that there are also other groups, so BAME colleagues, people with disabilities, um, all kinds of groups who've been seriously disadvantaged. And th this disadvantage is, is not new. It's just been exaggerated. So we need to find ways of dealing with it. Thank you, Alison. Over to you, Ampini. Thank you very much, um, uh, Denise. Um, a lot has been said already. Um, I just add my, my two pens. I don't think we should try to predict the future, but I think what we need to do is to identify desirable features that may need to be strengthened and those that we need to eliminate in order to come up with the futures, in plural, that we would like to do. And part of the reason that I'm saying this is because this is my research work that I'm, I'm currently doing for UNESCO and also for the university uh, network, the, the University Futures Network. So when, when we look at this, we are in a recovery stage. Uh, before it was responsive, and now we are in a recovery stage where we need to look at those features that we want us and want to see happening. And, and it's obvious that one feature that we that needs to, to, to be the one that we take forward to higher education in 2050, we can't even plan for 2030 anymore. We need to plan for 2050. Higher education is going to look completely different from what it is, from completely closed probably to more open openness. And by openness, I mean it has to be flexible, it has to be accessible, it has to be affordable, it has to be inclusive. And inclusive not only in terms of the students that we, we get, people with disabilities, marginalized communities, people from rural areas, but also inclusive in terms of the curriculum. And I'm talking from a developing context where our curriculum has by and large been, um, been very colonized for lack of a better word. And, and, and also looking at the knowledges that are not uh, really ingrained into, that, that are not part of, the, of our own indigenous knowledge system. So we see that in future, knowledges will be more diversified if we include, if we open up education as we need to open it up. And um, all this will only be, be done if one does a political will. And by political will, I'm talking about across the board, from government, institutions, everywhere. There must be a political will. And I believe that the only institution that will be resilient are those that are going to be changing the practices that they are comfortable with and, and, the, and, and the practices that they feel that they will go back to. And all of us are talking about there'll be no way of going back. And, and there are new players in higher education. There are new people who are coming in. And these people, we need to embrace them and work with them. There'll be more networked learning hubs because digitalization also uh, makes it, it, it increases collaborative um, but it, it, it increases partnership, it increases interconnectedness. And this interconnectedness will be used in different ways and in different formats. So it is also critical to do that. The last point that I want to raise is that I think we need to reimagine the mission of higher education. Are we in the business of just regurgitating content that we've already have, or we are in the business of responding to climate change, poverty, peace, migration issues. There are so many issues that the world is expecting us to, report, to respond to. Now we are talking a lot about knowledge economy, but there is green economy. 
that we need to focus on as well. How do we live side by side with other features within the world that we live in? And Thank the last part finish. is about humanity. That's a good Sorry. point to finish on. That's an excellent point to finish on. And poor John's got to pick up after that. So over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, actually, the checks in the post in these for letting me go last. It's brilliant to go last in, with this group of people. Um, so um, I, I agree. You know, predicting the future, especially for the tech field, is just that's just not a good thing to do. But but what I do, what I do, in fact, in my job, is I propose lots of nice futures futures to my bosses with a price tag. That's why I say here's a particular future, and this is how many millions it will cost. And, and, and in that spirit, I agree with what's been said. That I think uh, data and AI is going to be the big thing, and the great transformational power of that is, as Mpini said, it's in the connectivity. So it's not data for a single educational institution that will make <laughs> a difference, but uh, what I call an educational data space. So think about. Um, adhering to privacy norms, you connect the data for the hundreds of thousands of students or maybe millions of students who are learning, um, and you connect that data from the students to the um, education institutions so they can predict and analyze from that, and to employers. Um, and then one can build AI services on top of that. So one example of one thing that we've um, looked at in several projects is an AI career coach. You understand how the student's doing at a very fine grain level, how they're doing on their assignment and assessment. You understand their um, skills. You then um, can recommend jobs to them, which you're, you're automatically um, reading online. I, I take um, uh, Alison's point about the um, being careful about who owns the data. So we're currently, I do have friends who work in tech companies, but we're currently using Microsoft Teams. It's being used a lot for teaching, as is Google Classroom. So there is one future where Google and Microsoft own all of the student data, which may not be a good one. And we have to be um, um, aware of that. In terms of AI services one can create, of course, this is progressing all the time. There's a text generator now, GPT-3, if you look online, it, you give it a piece of text from Dickens or from Shakespeare, it will write an essay at undergraduate level from the input text. So, so that's, that's what happened in the last year. So I see this technology really changing how we represent knowledge. And you can see the, um, let's say the movement forward from going to paper, going to PDFs, XML, and now we'll represent all the content in a machine understandable form so you take all the online content that's there and there's some level of understanding that the machine has and then you can for example one of the things we're doing at the ou is we're building um well we're looking into giving every ou student their own personal ai assistant that would follow them for their career help organize their calendar tell them where assessments are duly aided with their tutors generate quizzes automatically automatically answer questions from their course content generate um, begin to uh, mark the assessment give informal feedback on that also giving assessments uh, ai tutors to our uh, human tutors to um, uh, analyze and predict student outcomes. We have an existing tool for that and, and organizing calendars. And then maybe finally, I would say, in terms of the point that um, Alison made, um, there is a group of technologists that think about what we call self-sovereign futures. So, and, and one of the leaders in this field is um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web. So we imagine a future where um, every student would own, control, and manage all of their learning data. Especially if one believes in lifelong learning, you're not going to learn at one institution. So your learning records, your assessments would be under your control. You control how those exposed to other education institutions and also to um, employers. I don't promise any of these things will happen, but this is a, somehow the bright future which I would like to have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. So maybe the Turing test is really <laughs> imminent and that will be your assignment. <laughs> Give us some answers from a question in your that you're learning, you know, in your area. Which of these was generated by a computer? Which of these do you think is of a standard from someone in your group? 
maybe that is the new future for reassessment. So I've taken some really good thoughts away from my own work. We do have time for one question. James, have we got any questions? Yes, thanks, Denise, we do. Tim has uh, questioned in the chat whether John thinks the OU should provide a support service to higher education, to students and to the public on online learning. So, so, so one of the great things about working at the OU, and maybe we all talk about it too much, is our social mission that we believe in social justice through education. Um, and in, along those lines, I, I think the OU should provide the service. I'm not the finance person for the OU, thank God, uh, but, but I would push to make this for free. So at least elements of the free. Mm -hmm. The OU, as people will know, already have free learning platforms. We have OpenLearn. We co-founded FutureLearn. So offering free services, uh, um, support services, w w would be good. Uh, actually, my, my bosses, I can hear him in my head now, they say to me, I should try not to lose too much money. So maybe some premium services would be chargeable, but we, we should be offering this. The, 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 and one of the reasons for this is that one of the things that somehow keeps me awake at night is the thought of thousands of educators across the globe replicating the work one needs to do for online teaching, building mm. their own materials from scratch, mm. analysing. And if that, that's one area where this could be shared, which is why we have the rise of the big tech companies. Thank you, John. So um, I'd like to, um, before I close the session, I'd like you to take your uh, mics off and not do the virtual clapping. Let's do the real clapping because this has been such an interesting and stimulating panel. Give lots of food for thought. But um, I, what I enjoyed was the um, strategic thinking, the robustness of, of um, argument, but more importantly, the passion that we heard this morning. Thank you. So come on, everyone. Yeah.